Hello and welcome to Kicking Tires. My name is Jimmy. And I'm Justin. And this week we got a lot of news. We got the Integra Mazda launch a new SUV, the CX-50. We got more information about the Subaru Solterra and the Toyota BZ4X. Um, there's information about the Kia EV9 and the Hyundai 7. They're basically the same thing. Uh, there's a new Heritage series that Hyundai is putting out. It's a concept. It's not going to come out, but Justin's in love. Uh, the Nissan Rogue gets a new engine. Porsche dropped some information about the GT4 RS. They also dropped some information about the Taycan and Motor Trend's car of the year. So a lot of information today. But we are going to start off with the Integra, the most hated hated drop of this year i think yeah so i I don't get it because it's exactly what we we were teased so we teased the front end we teased the back end and it's exact the yellow color was a bad choice i think the yellow color is a bad choice not gonna deny that i think the integra on the side was probably a bad choice as well the 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 lettering that's on the side yeah. yeah because we really don't need that um like honestly speaking, I don't think the Integra is that bad looking of a car. I don't. I think it's an okay looking car. Mm-hmm. It's exactly what we thought it would be. It's a Civic because the Integra has always been that. People say, "Oh, it's not a DC two. We gotta think back. The Integra wasn't always just a DC two. If you look at the first gen Integra, there was a five door version that looked kind of stumpy, like this. It's exactly what the Integra was right well and Even, the other thing is people are like well it doesn't look anything like a dc2 well a, a modern civic looks nothing like an eg yeah like there, there's nothing there's no comparison there it doesn't matter like we've moved on um i think my only complaint is really how the rear three-quarter resolves the, the the hatchback line and i have the same complaint about the civic i think the previous generation Civic hatchback looked better than the current one, just the way the lines come together. This one is a little bit cross y ZDX-y, yeah. um, and that is kind of the downfall. But I think a little bit of arrow, and you could make it work. I don't think it's that bad. And yeah, I think the internet people are a little bit crazy. Yeah. Everyone's hating on this because it's nowhere near the DC2. They're, they're, everyone's comparing this to the Integra Type R. No, and they're, exactly. And and I was just having this conversation yesterday and people were like, well, this is this is not a Type R. Like, this is not that DC2 R in their mind. I'm like, well, the Integra that people actually bought were not the GSRs or the Type Rs. Those are low volume cars. Yeah, it was the, the LS. <laughs> the <laughs> LS the and the GS Coupes. And like yeah. the pretty average, it's an average commuter car with like slightly nicer than a Civic, basically. So many people were complaining how like it's a 1.5 turbo. It's not a high revving 1.8. Your high revving 1.8 on the LS sedan, it only made 100 and. 40 150 horsepower this makes 200 like it's we don't know the actual figures yet right but like is that really such a bad thing it has the six speed it has a limited slip diff yeah. i i don't think it deserves all the hate that it's getting i get it it's not an integra but the civic's not a civic the mustang mock e it's not a mustang the eclipse cross it's not an eclipse the, the civic is a civic that, like that's the thing is that the civic if you have to compare it to the 1992 model or 99 or whatever however far you want to go back it's a different vehicle but it represents the same thing in the market which is that kind of compact sort of slightly above entry level car that a lot of people buy and it meets the needs for a lot of people. It's just the needs for people have changed. And EG Civic is not big enough for modern needs. So things change, things adapt. And that is how the whole automotive universe works. Like that's the name, <laughs> the name changes. Like it doesn't matter. It The ILX to me was always 
it's the same thing. It's the yeah. accurate version of the Civic, you know, yeah. and the Integra was the accurate version of the, you know, it's just, yeah. So technically speaking, the ILX actually skipped a generation of the Civic because we never got the 10th generation Civic mm -hmm. in an Acro format. So I guess people were hoping for more with the Integra. Um, in my opinion, if Acro actually just came up with this car and called it a CSX or the ILX, I don't think it would have been as bad in terms of the reception that it got. I think calling it the Integra is what got people all riled up because I'm looking through the comments. People are asking for two-door coupes. No one's going to make a two-door coupe. Let's be honest. They don't sell. No one's buying them. Everyone's buying SUV. We're lucky the Integra is not an SUV. Yeah. Right? And, like, and, and the, my, my thing is like the, the Supra was like this. They brought yeah. back a love name from the 90s and people lost their shit because it's a BMW. And then guess what? Two years down the road, we're all cool with it. We all like the Supra now. Yeah, because like people it's... people will get over. People will grow. Like it, it. I'm not worried for accuracy. I think it's no. It has potential, and it's I going think, to sell. And I think that people will eat their words. Yeah, yeah. I I'm I totally agree with you. It's going to sell. It's going to be a popular vehicle because those are looking like. If you're looking at the current gen Civic and you want something that's a little bit more luxurious on the inside, you want it to look a little bit better on the outside, you want it to be a little bit more practical, this being about $5,000 more, roughly, it's not a bad like segment to jump into. You get the more premium name, you get a little bit more f flexibility because it is a hatch. I don't see anything wrong with that comparing this to the Civic. And I think it's going to be, you know, pretty popular. Mm, I think I think there's definitely potential here. It's it's kind of a dead market, you know, but I think there is demand for like a little sporty car that, well, nowadays this is considered little, but, you know, yeah. if we go back, <laughs> this is probably the size of a legend. Yeah, it's, it's pretty big. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I was reading the comments on Acra's face, uh, YouTube page. Uh, a lot of people was like, I'd rather take a BMW 228i. Like no. no, a BMW 228 Grand Coupe. <laughs> it's twenty thousand dollars more than this. You're not comparing the same thing. All right, mm. so stop. <laughs> yeah. uh, I can't wait. To, I love it when people like say something about cars and then they they prove that they don't know anything about cars two years uh, down the road. Yeah, like you, they start eating their words. Speaking yeah. of completely off topic, um, there's a local Instagram social media influencer that she she gets a lot of these press cars and what was really cringy for me is she had a charger hellcat she looked at what the dash said for the speed oh no like, this is the top speed of this car oh no and she's like she's some tiktoker influencer like oh. it i was so cringe oh and today she posted um She's driving an EQS and she looked at the estimated range. She's like, wow, this can go 418 miles on the, the full charge. I'm like, no, it can't. <laughs> These are just numbers that's on the oh, dash. That is so cringe. Uh, but what isn't cringe and what is a success, I think, is this brand new Mazda CX-50. It's not supposed to be the replacement for the CX-5. It's another variation of SUVs that you can get from Mazda. And what they've gone here is they've gone rugged. It's a first for Mazda. It's the first Mazda to get an off-road mode. It's the first Mazda to get a towing mode. It's the first Mazda to get a panoramic sunroof. This is super exciting. I don't know how you feel about it. I know you've been a Mazda hater, but I want to hear your thoughts. Well, I love it because it's, <laughs> it's, it's everything the CX-30 should have been to me. The CX-30 has a foot of cladding from the, from the bottom, like as much cladding as this, but none of the ground clearance, none of the muscle to back it up in its design. I think the CX-30 is not an attractive car. And it, to me, the CX-30 is everything wrong with SUVs. It's like you take the regular Mazda 3, which is a perfectly fine car, and then you make it worse. 
<laughs> by by trying to make it look like an it's it's the Jeep Compass of Ooh. the first gen Jeep Compass. I thought of, I thought we loved crossovers. That car. We kind of like the Patriot, and th that's the thing: <laughs> is the Patriot came a little bit after the Compass, which is why when we were talking about it before the show, I'm like, this is kind of like the Compass and Patriot when they la when they landed in the mid 2000s. Is that they came out with this really ugly, kind of feminine but also masculine crossover thing that you know it's the Butch version of the normal hatchback, mm -hmm. uh, which was the cx30 or also the compass and and pull up a picture of a compass like 2006 compass is not a pretty vehicle uh and it's supposed to look softer around the edges you know the jeep trying to like you know break into a new market and then a year later they come up with a patriot which same bones underneath but just looked a lot more normal and a lot doesn't make you want to throw up at least with the Patriot design. It's just a box on wheels, but uh, you can't hate it. But the compass was was god awful. Um, so what I like about the CX-50 is, okay, so basis of the CX-50 is based off the Mazda 3 and CX-30 platform. It's a good platform, and Mazda is going to keep using that for a lot of their smaller cars. Even the MX-30 is based off this platform. So it's a good chassis to start with. Um, so they made it bigger. It's very obvious that it's bigger. Uh, we can see that with the pictures of the rear seats. There's a lot more room in here than the CX-30, and there's more trunk space. So what this is is going to be the off-road variant. Um, in all the press photos, they have AT tires on them. And I actually really like the look of this CX-50 with those AT tires. It's not like fake AT tires like the Ridgeline or the Cross Trek not tra trail hawk no what is honda calling trail, trail sport. sport yeah it's not the fake at tire look these are actual at tires on it like it looks absolutely amazing uh two engine options from the start the two and a half liter with 186 horse probably and a two and a half turbo with 250 great engine options however in their press release they said that there's going to be two or sorry not two there's going to be multiple electrical powertrains available so that's exciting that's going to be really cool because it's going to be the first hybrid or potentially plug-in hybrid for mazda what the news has kind of been floating around is it's using toyota tech the cx50 is built alongside the toyota corolla cross completely different segment corolla cross is smaller than a cx50 but it's built in the same plant in Alabama. But what the CX-50 is likely going to be using is RAV4 tech, that two and a half liter hybrid that you have in your vehicle, as well as potentially the Prime. That being in the CX-50 is something I can potentially see. Hmm. Is that going to be good though? That's a different question. Because, you know, Mazda probably can't make its own hybrid tech. It's expensive. There's a lot of R&D. It's probably easier just to partner with someone to get the uh, to get the the technology within their vehicles. But I'm I'm very excited to see that because, uh, I mean the two and a half turbo like it's plenty powerful. It's super punchy, but little like just the fuel economy that's on it. It's you know it's not desirable. Yeah, and the base engine is a little bit. You know, with a genuine five seater with a usable trunk, the 180 horse is 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 kind of lacking. Yeah, uh, that's kind of every review on the Forester is the same thing. Is they they just don't have the, <laughs> the muscle to to pull it through. Uh, I like the look, but I notice it's it's very wide but not very tall. Which you know, yeah. it's wide is not so nice off road just because you're more likely to hit, you can't avoid as much because it's wide. Same with being long, but you can be tall, have a little bit more ground clearance. And looking at the, the shape of the vehicle, I don't know how big of a tire we can really put on there, but, <laughs> you know, I'll let this, uh, you know, come to market and I'll see if it is potentially a RAV4 hybrid replacement for me down the road. Uh, I, interior wise, obviously Mazda is a step above, but oh, yeah. But w whether or not they can really produce 
these hybrids that's uh, the other question right toyota yeah. cannot meet up their own demand right now and they're doing other things in electrification and lexus same thing and so i don't know whether or not this will really come to market it's kind of like you know the car that i was really set on ordering was a cx5 diesel um a few years <laughs> back and that was you know you you i remember you go. i remember we're talking about it like maybe five years ago mm -hmm. and then 2016 it, I think. and then it fa finally came out like two years ago and then it was available for one year and then they just quiet it was a little bit it, it totally flopped that one it was year so too. bad <laughs> yeah it, it had so much potential because i was reading you know i was looking at reviews uh sky active d from australia and whatnot and i'm like oh yeah this seems like a good potential vehicle for me like i i could totally see myself in this and i i i signed up for all the alerts and everything and it's like and i i'm kind of seeing a bit of a flashback with the cx50 i'm getting a bit of deja vu with this car and it's like i could see myself in one of these i could you know especially if they're gonna bring out the hybrid i could see myself in one of these uh whether it's plug-in or whatnot but whether or not that that really happens i think we have to see how well it, it's executed when it does come to market. Um, one thing you did mention is the Forester. Uh, I saw on Mazda's YouTube page when they launched this, I was going through the comments again, as I always do. Uh, a lot of people are saying that the Forester Trail, nope. Wilderness? Wilderness Edition. I can't remember these off-road variants of these manufacturers, but the Forester Wilderness should have been this. This is how you make it. And there's not just one comment. There's a lot of comments saying the Forester, this should have been the Forester. This is what the Forester should be. <laughs> Subaru, take thing note. Is, I look at this car, especially the picture you have pulled up, and I'm like, I can tell in this picture that the Forester is more capable and a better <laughs> camping vehicle already. A base Forester, whatever the X model or XS, is going to be more capable than this because so, just the proportions are not quite like you can tell this is designed to be. Uh, this was a lift in Mazda 3. So, okay. So that's a good point. Mazda's press uh, event, I attended live um, online, and they're basically saying, like, Yes, this is kind of an off-road variant of their SUVs, but like 90% of their buyers, even on these type of Forester, uh, RAV4 type vehicles, you're like 90% going to be on-road. It's just that 10% that you're off-road. So they focused on the on-road performance first, and then they're like, what can we do to add on? the off-road kind of readiness to it. So in the off-road mode, like they showed in their video, it actually works really well. The automatic um, traction control system that they have helps with oversteer. It helps with locking of the wheels when there's unbalanced um, moguls and whatnot. Like there's really cool tech underneath to help this in off-road scenarios. So I'm curious of what it can do. Um, when it does come out, I want to ask Mazda if I can take one to hail, and we'll try it out. Test this versus your RAV4. That's what I want to do. There's, I don't think there's any chance. It's just the ground clearance just doesn't seem like it's there. The overhang seems we'll see. pretty bad. It, it's it's long. It's absolutely long. The front end is real long. Like it, that is, it is. Uh, yeah. But we'll see, right? We'll see. You don't need it's, to ask, man. It's easier to ask for forgiveness. <laughs> for is, I, is, I have yeah, a really I, good relationship with Mazda, and I don't want to ruin that. <laughs> yeah, because they clearly have not been following the Kicking Tires podcast. <laughs> uh, it's talking about SUVs and whatnot. Uh, Toyota launched their BZ4X. I mean, we talked about this before. Uh, there was a bunch of leaks and whatnot, but they officially released some information along with Subaru releasing information on the Solterra. So the BZ4X comes standard as a front-wheel drive vehicle. It has 250 miles of range. The front engine model, I believe it's 150 kilowatts, which is about 200 or so horsepower, if I recall correctly. Um, and then the all-wheel drive version is 280 kilowatt 
motors, which combines to about 215, 220 uh, horsepower. So there's two models for Toyota in terms of powertrain anyways, but Subaru, because it's Subaru, all-wheel drive is standard for them. And you get 8.6 or 8.3 inches of ground clearance. You get X mode for actual off-road performance. Yeah, I feel like this is probably going to outperform the CX-50 (laughs) off-road. But I'll I'll ask for both of them at the same time and we'll give it a shot, right? (laughs) Yeah, I I like the styling DNA with the BZ4. I think it's very distinctively Toyota. I think it's going to be an awesome car for them. It competes right against that ID4 in terms of price point from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be... I think it's going to be a great model because it's going to be reasonably affordable. Think low 40s, probably under fit. Well, front wheel drive definitely going to be under 50k. Um, you can all wheel drive for 50k with with real range, you know, usable range for under 50k. This, I think, this is kind of the car we needed. Is from a company that's known for reliability, that's now delivering good range, and you know, we don't have to look at you know kind of off-brand evs like the uh the bolt euv or those are kind of more niche vehicles i think the bolt and the the leaf and cars like that that i don't think they really meet the needs of most people i think this is just a more practical form factor and it's coming from a huge auto manufacturer with uh, a lot of backing to it that i i think both of these cars are going to be winners and i would not bet against them no, I think I think overall they're pretty good. Um, what I don't like is the interior. There's bits and pieces that still remind me of '90s Toyota. Um, just it's some chunky. of the switch, some of the switch here that that's just built in. It just looks the steering cool. wheel is so ugly. <laughs> um, well, I mean, at least this you get a steering wheel because on a Toyota you can get a yoke, um, and it's a hundred and 50 degrees of lock to lock rotation so you never have to actually fully take your hands off the wheel Hmm. that's going to be a completely new driving experience you know when you first get into it you're trying to like just make a small left turn and you do this and you like just completely end up in the opposite lane yeah it's gonna (laughs) be it's like that video of like i don't know if you saw that tiktok they were mocking consumer reports of like oh how do i drive this and they were they were reviewing the Model S. Plan oh, like, yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's really not that crazy, I think. Uh, it will take you two days to get used to it, and then you'll be fine. Um, size-wise, it's 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 about the same size, uh, same length as the RAV4. Yeah, it's the uh, same platform. Yeah, TNGA. Yeah. They're really stretching that. Yeah. The only thing I can see that it's going to be less compared to the RAV4 is just the trunk space um, mm. because it's, it's an so EV, slanted. <laughs> it's like it has that coupe like profile on the back so it's going to be less for sure here here it is going through a water crossing Ooh, it doesn't even reach a bottom like this is not a water crossing this is just like a pond it's like three or four inches of water that's all that is. that is someone's like water feature at like a country <laughs> club some 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 ass just drove into someone's like garden <laughs> like i'm gonna climb this because i can um but yeah the overhangs look reasonable i can see there being potential but ev i don't know 250 miles range i don't know how far you would really want to take that and risk it off road yeah i mean it's not like you can fill it up it's not like you can bring a few batteries and just you know but it's, it it's cool that they've got their bases covered, right? Like the Prime yeah. is is one of the best sellers. Doesn't really have any real competition. Have you seen yes. Prime prices, by the way? Like people Eight, are trying to ask 70k. 70 yeah. And I'm uh-huh. like, dude, this car, like you buy it to save money. That's why there's appeal. You trying to sell it for 70 just defeats the purpose of even anyone picking it. No one's going to buy it for that price. Yeah, well, that's what you think. I, I know it like you can ask whatever you want for it but no one's realistically <laughs> buying these cars you might get one lucky customer but yeah even the hybrids I saw I saw XSEs listing for like 50 something K I'm like <laughs> no I'm not paying 10k over MSRP to save a little bit on fuel maybe you should list yours and get a real truck like a 2003 Toyota RAV4 
<laughs> so, all right, let's move on from Toyota. Uh, Kia and Hyundai has some news about their next EV. So, of course, we know about the EV6 and the Ionic 5. That's going to be coming soon, early next year. That's going to be like their first electric vehicle. And this is going to be their second here. The EV9, I think that's what it's called. Is it EV9? Yes. It doesn't even have the name on here. I don't. I can't even check. Oh, it's on the press release page. The <laughs> Kia Concept EV9. The Kia's EV... all-electric SUV concept takes center stage at Automobility LA. So it's EV9 and the 7. So they're calling the Hyundai Motor 7, but not Ionic 7. So I don't know if they're dropping the Ionic name or not, but I, I don't know. It's very confusing. It's very much a toaster box on wheels. Please Google it. Hyundai Motor 7 concept. It's 7 spelled out in letters. Yeah, uh, in caps as well. Yeah, it, <laughs> both of these vehicles are just like toasters it, on wheels. They're, they're, they're full on concepts at this time, which means that they have like glass ceiling, really funky seats. Like none of the things that you're seeing right now, it's going to end up in production other than maybe some of the styling traits that it has. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is basically going to be their Telluride and Palisade um, EV, which is smart because that's like one of the bigger segments that they have, right? Yeah. So and this relatively is gonna... untapped, like a full size three row yeah. SUV. There's no nothing one... really. Uh... I mean, Tesla Model X, but that's a hundred grand. It's not least. even full size. Like the, it's the actually pretty rows. small. Yeah, it's pretty small. Yeah. So I mean, the wheelbase on this. When I was reading the press information, I was impressed. Ten feet, six inch wheelbase. That is <laughs> massive. You can fit the RAV4 in it. Like <laughs> it's it's <laughs> massive. They're they're looking at about 300 miles of range, and they want to include a 350 kilowatt charger, which will equate to 10 to 80 percent in 20 minutes. I can already see the reviews now. They're going to be like, well, when this comes to it, will come to the market. It will. Uh, it, they, they will be like. Oh, the, the big battery makes for a lower center of gravity. This thing handles like it's on rails. <laughs> like, it's like every generic. You, you, you mean uh, every, every, yeah, every EV review yeah. ever? Compared to other full-size three-row SUVs, this thing handles amazing. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Pre thanks, thanks for that. Really appreciate it. Does it, <laughs> does, it, does, it does it break well over a period of time? No, it probably doesn't. Uh, but let's skip ahead here because I think this, this one... This is the Hyundai EV I really care about. <clears throat> I'll let you go through it. <laughs> so this, this, is, this is your favorite. Is, uh, this is the uh, Hyundai Grandeur flagship sedan. It's it's uh, based off of an, an 80s luxury sedan from Hyundai. I didn't even know this existed, but I guess if you're a diplomat from South Korea, this is the vehicle <laughs> that you, you, you rocked in the 80s uh i love everything about it i love the exterior i love the uh led parametric pixel exterior lighting um i love the interior i think the burgundy leather and kind of the 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 bronzish accent it it just the the, the mood and you can smell the leather and the cigar <laughs> smoke and, and whiskey and whatnot and it's just very Mad Men vibe about it, which I love. Um, the steering wheel, everything about it is cool. Just look at the interior. Exterior, it, it is another box on wheels, but the, the headlights and taillights do kind of modernize it. And it's very reminiscent of Cyberpunk 2077, if anyone played that game last year. That was like last winter's uh, kind of big big re release game mm -hmm. full of bugs uh but they had <laughs> one of a their limo company had a very similar looking um resto mod ev well i don't know if it was ev but limo looking thing but yeah it's pretty cool obviously it will never come to market because you don't want well i want it yeah but you know but, we we got to remember that we're weird and we want weird things like i want to buy okay. these on Mirada Here's the thing, Cabriolet. is like you know how those like JDM taxis and 
they oh, still yeah, yeah. reuse that same design from yep. 30 years ago i think like there's a case to be made there and just like doing like a futuristic re- redesign of that and like you go to china and they have like volkswagen bodies from the 90s uh still being made and yeah. it's like I, but, I can see this in other markets potentially being like but, oh this is the electric taxi even those taxis are getting completely revamped they by are like replaced yeah yeah with, they, with they, like jelly bean looking cars like yeah they're not, <laughs> toyota they're not made cool anymore. specific taxis for the the asian the the asian market like they're very actual jelly bean looking things yeah <laughs> they're not gonna have sedans anymore but yeah. i i have to admit this is super funky i love it um there's a lot of hyundai design language in here the taillights headlights it's very reminiscent of the ionic 5 which mm. to me it's a good looking vehicle as is um i actually really like the ionic 5 i like it more than a tesla model y because of the way it looks but yeah. charging network you know we'll get into that in the future um something that was kind of like a surprise is nissan this kind of fell under the radar because there's not a lot of people talking about it uh but the rogue came out back in 2021 i think i think it came out this year yeah um I think it's one of the best SUVs you can get because it has, like, Nissan put, Nissan doesn't have a lot of money. I mean, they do, but they don't. And no, they don't. Can, <laughs> they don't can, have much R&D budget at all. Yeah. And we can see that that they don't have that much money because the Z uses an old platform. The Frontier uses an old platform. The Pathfinder uses an old engine. And, like, there's, there's just a lot of vehicles that they have. The brand new vehicles that are using old stuff because they don't have a lot of money. Same thing with a Rogue. When that came out, not a lot of money. So they put the old engine in it. And when I reviewed it, I said that the Rogue is almost perfect minus the engine. I wanted to see a hybrid powertrain, which I'm sure will come because the Outlander has a PHEV version coming. I'm sure it's going to come over to the Rogue. But today, we're not going to talk about PHEV. The Rogue gets a new engine. It's a VC turbo, a variable compression engine it's a 1.5 three cylinder it's essentially the same two liter that you get in the qx55 qx50 but with one cylinder lobbed off to make this little 1.5 it's still paired with the cvt but the cvt has been updated with better um, thermal management as well as better oil oiling on it i'm sure it's just to increase uh, the longevity of the uh the transmission Mm. which i know you know we all know that there's been problems in the past but this this engine it 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 just it strikes a really good balance because it's more powerful than the old one at 201 horsepower and 225 pound feet of torque and it gets better fuel economy 7.6 liters for 100 kilometers in this oh that's combined sorry even with all-wheel drive 33 miles per gallon it's That's pretty solid for a vehicle a, this size. It's a good balance. It's a really good balance. I, I still would like a hybrid, to be very honest. But now the top trim is getting this. It's now like it, it's something that's a little bit more comparable to the RAV4, the CRV, because the old engine, it, it really struggled. 185, I think, horsepower. 2.5 it just didn't have the guts yeah because the- i think this segment especially you need to be very competitive because mm-hmm. you're you're fighting the giants right like the rav4 and the crv and even the forester as underpowered as we talk about uh these these cars have a really loyal fan base mm-hmm. and the rogue i don't feel like it has that backing to it that you know, I, I know a lot of CRV owners that trade it in and get the same car, like even this within the same generation. That that kind of boggles my mind. But um, yeah, people are loyal to these brands. And I think Nissan's got to step it up in terms of, you know, wowing someone and really bringing someone over. You've got to deliver better power, better fuel economy, which I think it's doing a good job. And the interior is fairly 
nice. Two is good. Uh, you know, for this generation, I you know, new CRV is gonna be better. I think maybe it, I don't know. It it should. I mean, it's based off the new Civic. The new Civic's really good. It should be good, but yeah, yeah they're they're quite behind the times now, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And they uh, they always undercut the the main the main brands a little bit, right? Nissan yeah. Well, that's exactly how they sold the previous generation Rogue. It wasn't better than anyone. It was just priced a lot better than everyone else. Yeah. And I, I thought mean, it was a little bit better. Um, like interior wise, it's nicer in a RAV4. Even the old one compared to the old RAV4. Yeah. Um, and there's a little bit more space as well. Yeah. But I think what where they really get you is uh, usually finance rates or warranty and stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Let's move on to something a little bit more exotic. Porsche. Porsche launched the GT4 RS. And it's going to be everyone's track car. Just like, I'm in this, well, we're in this group chat together. And when the information of the GT4 RS dropped, everyone was drooling and oogling over it. This, uh, this powered by the the gt3 it, it's i mean it's it's pretty awesome it's it not is just a, and it's not a you know it wasn't a secret we all saw this car testing at the nurburgring with mm-hmm. that swan neck wing all camouflage and whatnot um i think what's kind of unique about the gt4 rs is because um it doesn't have real competition you know it's it's in kind of a no man's land and that allowed Porsche engineers to have fun with this car. Uh, I was watching the uh, the UK Top Gear uh, mm. interview and, you know, they're talking with the, uh, the Porsche guy and he's like, yeah, this is the most engaging, most fun car because we don't have to build it to a certain spec. We don't have any competition it's not like the gt3 which is the benchmark for a lot of other sports cars this is just its own thing um now price point wise that that's kind of the 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 thing is we we have a target price point for this vehicle where it will really land though that is the question is msrp is just a suggestion but (laughs) uh, you know porsche's there's a lot of politics going around and people probably have had a deposit on this car for four or five years uh since the gt4 came out there's been rumors of an rs people probably wanted to step in line and you know what your place in line doesn't mean anything because if someone's willing to to take a loss on a trade-in better than you then they cut ahead of you and there's just a little like a lot of stuff going on that turns me off from the whole porsche buying experience and ownership experience you know i always talk about how all gt owners talk about is resale value they don't you know especially in the local scene it's it's very resale value um you go to nurburgring though and there's gt cars for days like people bring these cars out uh i think it's pretty dang neat i do want to note that the blue, the mag blue bag magnesium wheels. Uh, interesting pick. It's an optional wheel, actually. You it's have to get Y-Sack the Y-Sack pack. package. It's yeah. not actually part of the Y-Sack. It's oh, optional it's on top of the Y-Sack package because <laughs> that is how Porsche makes their money. But the, the Y-Sack <laughs> package, they, they said, okay, well, the GT2 RS, basically everyone picked the Y-Sack package. So they, they offered it on the GT4 RS. Um, and basically gives you the roll cage, gives you exposed carbon bits all over the car, the hood, the mirrors, the wing, and uh, the titanium little side vents. Titanium tip exhaust, I remember. Titanium exhaust. It's it's pretty neat. I think if you get this car, you have to get the Visac package. But the blue wheels, I feel like, it, again, it will help you in terms of resale value because that's probably what you care about if you're considering buying this car. But... Okay, had someone come out in the aftermarket and brought a car like this to SEMA four years ago, everyone would be throwing up. <laughs> like this, the hood looking like that. Oh, we modeled it after the GD2 RS. Uh, you know, we put blue wheels on an off blue car. Like, 
the blue on blue like really and then we we put a swan neck wing like if this were done after market you would all hate it but because porsche is the one to do this uh everyone's drooling over it but i swear i had some <laughs> gambala or someone like just <laughs> you know if if we decided to break through his concrete chamber uh and produce something like this with the exposed carbon and everything people would think it's tacky because like the colors don't match it's it's a different blue on the body and the, the wheel yeah the, the um, blue is pretty weird the blue wheels are pretty weird um yeah. and i'm not a fan of that that stripe that's on the hood that you can get i know the gd2 rs had that mm -hmm. but that stripe on the carbon i personally i don't find that appealing yeah and i, I think I, objectively if Again, if it didn't come from Porsche, it would be tacky. Yeah, it's kind of uh, like a skunk stripe. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's very it's very odd. Um, and another, I really like the intake on the side window because mm -hmm. that side window, if you ever hopped in a seven eighteen or Jeep came in anything, it doesn't really do anything. Uh, and they turned it into an intake, which supposedly sounds pretty dang cool because um when you're driving you're hearing that air being sucked in because it's a mid-engine car yeah i think he said it's less than 30 centimeters away from your head yeah it, it's just so cool like it it makes sense from both a functional design and emotional way mm -hmm. that's kind of like how appealing that that is uh it's also super lightweight obviously with any rs product it's a fair bit lighter than a regular GT4 PDK. Um, you know, we got to go apples to apple. It's still lighter than the manual from what I saw, but it's, it's yeah, it is only available as a PDK. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, I think I was on uh, Jason Kamitas's Instagram. He says he's like, eh, no manual, no care. <laughs> no, the manual's <laughs> trash. Like I've driven the manual GT4s. I don't think it's, like the shifter feels decent, but like everyone says, the gearing is way too long. Mm. Uh, but then again, now that you have an extra hundred horsepower, then that kind of Might fixes that, that. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm kind of overdriving manuals, uh, especially in this speed category. I I I love a manual. You know, a GR86. I will never pick an automatic. Same with an that. MX5. That automatic's pretty good though. MX5, I definitely would pick manual, but the auto that's in the GR, well, on the last like, FRS wasn't for horrible. those little cars. Like it's just, it's I guess the engagement. I, I get is what you mean. Still better. I absolutely, hundred um, percent agree. But I'm just saying in that one, it wasn't I don't think that it's terrible. bad. Yeah, I don't even think the MX5 one is terrible. The MX1 but it's just the manual is just a better <laughs> experience, but. Having driven the GD4 manual, I'm like, I can live without this. The clutch is way too heavy for traffic, <laughs> and the gearing is way too long. And but but like the go to a track and you leave in one gear. But like the Porsche guy says, if you want to drive every day, you're not taking this. This is like your bike that you want to take out every now and then. This yeah. is not going to be the vehicle that you want to be driving you see the problem with the manual was the gear was so long and you, you watch videos of the local track mission vimc these are tight tracks and you leave it in one gear and you just two three two three two three sometimes like it's just it's it's not the manual experience you're looking for it's, anyways it's, it's just asking for a dog box in that case mm. if it's just going from second to third all the time <laughs> yeah it's just those two gears the rest of them don't are irrelevant and uh yeah i think i like this car for what it stands for because from an engineering perspective i love that they can do things that just emotionally trigger you and <laughs> just yeah it's just an exciting car um but i've the speculators are, are just going to ruin this like this is such a baby for that market because it does it's it's weird enough that those people are going to love every little bit of it and oh i spec'd it with this i spec'd it with that this is the one of whatever i got the first one with this combination and like i just don't like that whole scene and this gt4 rs is just 
it's a baby for a speculator market i think it is yeah we're we're going to see it 100% like someone's going to buy one i mean even they they even said that it's not like a uh, it's not a limited num- production. Exactly. It's not a numbered car. So yeah. they're going to keep making this for two, three years. That's what he said. That Porsche guy, I forgot his name. But he said he's gonna, they're, they're going to keep making this for two, three years. But it wouldn't matter. You know, it, they're so limited anyways. Yes, they're not limited run, but they're so limited. You're going to have a hard time finding one and getting one. And on a used market, as it is right now, I'm sure someone's going to buy one first and, you know, try to sell it for double what it is Mm -hmm. um speaking of other porsches one that you probably don't care too much about but i i kind of like but it's it's a taycan lineup um we'll just quickly go over this so taycan you can get a four a 4s a 4s in the cross turismo which is the wagon but now they put out the gts slotting between the four and the 4s and the turbo that doesn't have a turbo (laughs) it's 590 horsepower with the over boost function with the gts it's price in between and like i i personally like the gts cars um i like the gts 911 the cayenne and i just think it's like the sweet spot without going too crazy because the turbo is it's a lot let's be honest um i've driven a taycan 4s for a very little bit and i thought it was more than enough but this gts and sport turismo this this looks really really good to me especially the red on black 152k though a little little pricey yeah the gts (laughs) has always been that value line in the porsche lineup if you can call it that because it gives (laughs) you a lot of the the elements the styling elements of the the turbo s's but being 40 percent cheaper uh, and that's kind of the appeal with the GTS. It's it's more in line with the the standard model in terms of performance, but you get the top of the line looks. Yeah, I think the GTS Sport Turismo doesn't come with those fender flares as well. Oh, because it's not the uh, it's not the Cross Turismo. It's a Sport Turismo. So, yeah. So is the on- is it the only one that doesn't have the flares? I don't know. But looks it, like looks, it. it looks really good without those flares. It's, uh. Yeah, the flares are a weird touch because of how low slung this car is. Yeah. Like they're they're going for that Audi all road look, but I don't <laughs> I saw videos, you know, people took it off road when they're testing it, but like it's it's way too long and way too low to have any like the slightest pothole and you're bottoming out. Like you don't take this off road. So Absolutely. I don't really get the point. Because it it just it cannot there's, do it. There's no real point to it other than saying that you can. I think that's really what it comes but down to. But you can't. But you, I mean, let's be honest. If you're buying a Porsche Cross Turismo, you're not going to be taking it off road, anyways. I mean, yeah. if you just have to drive, okay, like like right now when some roads are washed out and you have to take a light gravel road <laughs> that has small potholes. This thing is still going to bottom out. That's that's the <laughs> that's the thing. But, Whereas you look at the Panamera and the 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 cross Turismo, but the 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 Sport Turismo, yeah, there's a version Panamera of the Sport Panamera. Turismo. Like that's perfect to be like, and that's why the GTS kind of <clears throat> makes sense because it's not writing checks they can't cash. It's just being honest. You know, this is a sport luxury executive wagon, and that's all it's trying to be. It's not trying to be an off-roady fake SUV thing because it just isn't. Yeah. So that's why the GTS kind of matters because they're allowing us to get it in the sport turismo mode. And and I'm a big fan of it. Mm-hmm. Speaking of big fans, Motor Trend is a big fan of Lucid because they named it the 2022 Car of the Year. So the Lucid Air It's basically a Tesla Model S competitor, right? It's a luxury, uh, ultra luxury in a way, um, sedan that Mm -hmm. is, you know, super long in terms of range. It's very comfortable. It has all the things that you will want in an EV. And I don't think it's a bad thing that they won 
Motor Trends Car of the Year. I think it's well deserved. But can you get one? Not yet. But this is <laughs> uh, this is the 2022 Car of the Year. So uh, I've already seen a bunch of reviews and test drives for this car. So it is production ready. But it's just it's a bad time right now. <clears throat> Same with the Rivian that they're just not that. Uh, harder I, to come to market. I saw Riven, Rivian here. BC plates. Nice. They tried to bring it what? to my friend's shop, actually. Oh. Uh, my friend to to do the uh, the out of province or whatever inspection. But oh. they're like, we, we're not going to touch that because we just, it's just too, we don't want to hang our names over that and say, we, we pass this thing legally. It is legal to drive on the BC roads. Um, so, yeah, it, it that was like three, four weeks ago that they were bringing them over the border. Oh, okay. um, but yeah, Lucid is kind of the brainchild of one of the guys that worked on the Model S. Um, but what is really unique about the Lucid and why it deserves Car of the Year is that it just pushes the boundaries for EV. For so long, we've been staring at Tesla, 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 Tesla. Whenever it comes to EV, everything has to measure up to Tesla. <clears throat> and they've they've kind of flipped the script here because we have giant manufacturers, you know, Volkswagen, Audi, Toyota, and none of them can match Tesla's charging and their range and their performance. Uh, and Ford is in there too. And like, no one can really keep up with their growth and as much of that is uh flawed with the tesla ownership experience you know lucid is here to what's really unique about it is the power density i guess um there's a few things that it, it does really well the lucid uh lucid air um the engine the not engine the, the motor uh, is very power dense. So it means, I think, what, like, what's the peak, or if you get the top of the line, it's like 1,100, it's, it's well into the four digits. It gets, it's stupid fast. Uh, but not only is it stupid fast, but it's also a lot of range, it's a lot of efficiency, it's a lot less weight and size. So if you look at the side of this vehicle, that's kind of where it really stands out is that it's quite. There's no uh, prestige gap or whatever you want to call it between the front door and the front wheel. The front wheel. It's it's a very cab forward design. Um, you know, it's a typical jelly bean look like every EV, but it's it's shifted very forward, and so the A pillar and the front bumper, you know, it's just kind of one very smooth line, and they were able to achieve much bigger interior volume in a smaller space, which is kind of neat. Yeah, because I was reading on that, they actually have like S-class type interior space. Yeah. It's an E-class overall length and wheelbase. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, benchmarking in S-class, if you're trying to make a luxury EV is not a bad place to start. Um, and yeah, I think the cool thing is, yeah, the how small it is. I think we're gonna see that power plant uh, translate into other uh, other models. It's going to work really well in crossover. Like this technology and the engineering behind this vehicle is going to be so important. I think the Air itself being a flagship luxury sedan costing well over $100,000. It, it's, it's cool. It's, it's, a, it's a cool product, but I think we have to look further down the road and where is their Model 3 competitor where is their Model Y competitor going to land? I think those are what I'm more excited about. But same with Tesla, you know, the Model S is really what put them on the map, not the Roadster. Mm -hmm. um, but the Model S is what put them on the map. But the Model 3 and the Model Y is the car that really, really put them on the map, like in terms of volume. Yeah, um, yeah that's everything that Lucid is doing is going to translate down the road. I actually uh, really, really like some of the information that's here. So the Lucid uses Bilstein Dampertronic Sky adjustable shocks like Mercedes, but pairs them with coil springs rather than air springs. And I actually really like that. 
because like mm-hmm. adjusting a ride height in an EQ or sorry, uh, like an S class, rarely do you ever adjust a ride height. I mean, why would you need to? It's not like something that you need to do, but adjusting the dampers, that's actually useful because that does affect the ride. And in the blurb here, it says that in smooth, the air is comfortable and quiet, if slightly floaty. In swift, it feels like a great all-rounder. So like you can have kind of best of all worlds with the suspension that they have in this. I love what they've done with the interior too. I think the materials... Everything is kind of unique. Uh, it looks special enough to be a flagship vehicle because that's my my gripe with the Model S is that when you're paying $200,000, I really want it to be nicer than that. Well, and the Model S and the Model Y just really, or not the Model Y, the Model S and the X really don't match that price with, tag. With the update, this does. With the update the, it's gotten better, absolutely. Um, but the old one, I would 100% agree with you. The old one was really bad um, because it, it hasn't been updated. It's almost since the beginning. But this interior, this Lucid interior, it's kind of a, a mix between a Taycan and an Escalade because it has that super wide cluster right in front of you, which, I mean, let's be honest. You know, if you're if you're driving a Model 3, like, sure, you don't always need your cluster, but a cluster is just so useful because mm-hmm. you see your data not just off to the side. You, yeah. you just look down slightly and it's right there. It's just something that we're more natural towards. And this amazing dash that the Lucid has gives you all that information right in front of you and still has like a tablet style display on the bottom mm-hmm. for, I'm sure, climate control and all the other stuff. Yeah, Tesla knows that too. They know that a speedometer in where a speedometer should go makes sense. That's why the Model S has it. Yeah, they Um, added the three, the three doesn't. Um, But yeah, this interior to me is at least on par with other flagship sedans. The Model S, despite the update, is still on par with cars one third of its price, Hmm. I think. (laughs) And that's that's kind of the, the issue with the Model S. Um, and I think this is really going to take a lot of a lot of buyers uh, from Tesla for the full size sedan. Yeah, I I absolutely think so. I'm like I I'll, I won't be able to afford something like this. It's it's not something that's going to be within my price range. So I'm excited to see you know what else that they're going to come up with something smaller. Yeah, uh, it's like we can't afford a Model S Plaid either, but everything just dilutes down to the Model 3, which a lot more people can afford. Yeah, it's, uh, And that's kind of the beauty of electric technology. Yeah. is A lot of this is going to have a, tr- a really good trickle-down effect. And I think this Lucid is just... It's been a while since we've seen someone push the boundaries. Uh, I just hope execution-wise, again, get get on it um i think okay here's the thing is everyone talks about tesla's charging network which as good as it is it is the best like right now it is the best but supercharging i don't know if it's you know a lot of people don't like to do it because it's bad on your battery uh you still have to wait like the the cool thing about this car is that you can charge even faster and like it technically can charge faster, but you can get efficiency is the, is the game because you can get what 300 miles of range in like 20 minutes. And that is, that is insane. 300 miles in 20 minutes. Like they are now boasting that they have the fastest charging car. And the thing is, if you live in a city center, which if you're affording, I've talked about this many times, people always talk about, oh, if I need to drive across from New York to LA, I can't even get any other. It has to be a Tesla. No one is driving from New York to LA, right? Like for how people really use their cars, you know, in a city center and you can afford your own charging station because you probably have a detached house and, you know, all this money to buy your $200,000 luxury sedan, you know, that's where 
I think really it, it matters is, you know, if you can charge it at home in 20 minutes and be good for the whole week, like that is solid. Yeah, that's pretty good. Like that's, I don't think the supercharging is really that big of a deal. Every journalist, again, just goes on and on about how great supercharging is and how no one, no one can compare. But I'm like, I know a lot of people with non-Tesla EVs that have no problem getting around, <laughs> you know? And I know a lot of Tesla people complain about charging stations. People leave trash around, people leave their car, it's done charging, they're hogging the space. You know, there's a lot of drama around these Tesla ownership groups <laughs> about their charging stations. It's not, it's not that amazing. I don't, I, I don't know. I think what it comes down to for the Tesla network is just it's available to them because the Tesla network is only available to Teslas, but they can also charge on regular, like J1 3037. Yeah, I mean, the adapter isn't expensive. So just get the adapter and you can plug it into any um, any chargers that's basically, you know, at any uh, EV charge spot. So I think, you know, it's fine. And the ability to just charge it in a lot more spaces, it's just, it's a nice to have. Like, that's one of the reasons why, like, you know, if I wanted to get uh, an EV, Tesla's going to be higher on the list simply due to that network. It's the ability. It's not like I want to or need to always charge it there. You know, when I move, I'm going to have uh, a charger in my in my garage. And mm-hmm. that's going to be fine. But for that week that I'm going to be traveling out of the, the, uh, the city, I don't have to worry as much. I think it is an advantage. I think but, there's just too much compromise with the Tesla ownership experience. Oh, that- absolutely. I, yeah. I, I 100% agree with you. I do not want to buy a Tesla, but the network kind of like levels some of that out. Like out of all the EVs right now, the one that I like the most is the Ionic 5. I think that's going to be one of the, the best, coolest EVs that you can buy because it doesn't have that ordinary rounded shape. It's mm-hmm. cool to look into. Like in the interior, is it's just so spacious. There's nothing wrong with the Ionic Five, other yeah. than the fact that GT, the GT EV6 from Kia, it's a little bit better looking in some mm-hmm. angles. But I think the Ionic Five is the EV. It's, to get. it's pretty unique, like that. that yeah. It's pretty cool. Uh, and yeah, I don't think, like, I think as far as reading reviews, watching YouTube and whatnot. When you do your research with purchasing an EV, just think realistically, am I going to be able to get by with this car? Do I need X many more charger stations than than other brands? Because I could not tell you where fast gas or super safe gas stations are <laughs> in my area because it doesn't matter because realistically... I can feel my vehicle where I feel it, and I have no problem with that. I know that if I go up into the boonies, or like if we decide to go to Hill Creek, uh, there's there may not be a Chevron or a Shell nearby, but there is some off-brand, non-top-tier gas that I could put in my vehicle, perhaps if it takes it, and if it works, like, it works. <laughs> yeah, and, but the thing is like how relevant is that to the real ownership experience Re- weight against having a car that is actually well built yeah. right i and i i got i got to say i i do really like driving teslas <laughs> i got to i got to like i got to put that out there is that i i love driving their cars but i think there's just there's just so much opportunity out there for and and everyone is just hanging on to Tesla because of this charging network, which I think for urban environments like here in Vancouver, I don't think it's that big of a deal. No, I don't really think isn't. it's it's a deal breaker. I I don't think so neither. Um, I mean, I mean the past two years has been a little bit different, but the years before that, like we used to only go on big road trips maybe twice a year. And those are the only times where that charging network is a little bit more important. And mm-hmm. that's it. But yeah. 
I think that's really it for this week. Anything else you want to add? Oh, we should talk a little bit about our off-road project. The reason, the one I want to bring up, uh, oh, the lift kit is in. So we're an inch and a half taller now. We have a lot more ground clearance. We have a good almost 10 inches under the front pipe. If you watched our video when we first introduced the RAV4, the front pipe was kind of the big concern, as well as the oil pans next to it. Uh, now everything is is 10 inches or higher off the ground, basically. With the <laughs> tires and the lift. And there was a knocking sound in the rear. That's now gone because the shocks have been replaced with Rock Auto Specials that cost, before shipping, eleven forty four. Her side. <laughs> the shock absorbers for this car were so cheap. And that's the beauty of having a light duty vehicle is that they don't cost very much to maintain because it is essentially a lifted Corolla. Um, and I stress that again and again is that if you go heavy duty, expect to pay heavy duty prices for labor, for parts and whatnot. And things will seize and things will break and you'll hurt yourself working on it. <laughs> this car is a joy to work on. Uh, but what I really want to talk about was that one, we, we went downhill Creek hard way, uh, on remembrance day, which is the day after our last week's podcast. Uh, so it went down hard way just fine. But what I really want to talk about is the flooding because now off-roading is no longer on the table for most people because there are no roads. And I don't mean that in a quirky way. There are literally no roads. <laughs> we can't go wheeling anymore. So I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to take the car out and, and have some fun with it before the disaster that has happened this week uh, with the flooding and our highways being destroyed uh, because you can't go north, you can't go east. You can only go south, but uh, the, the south border is opening up. But yeah, I'm, I'm just, I just want to say how grateful we are that we got the chance in the short period of time from purchasing the vehicle to, to bringing it out. We haven't even had a chance to run it lifted yet, to be honest, but with the new suspension, because that was only yesterday we got the new shocks on. Um, but yeah, I think the off-roading scene locally is going to look very different in the next few months because, yeah, there's a lot of places you just can't go to anymore. Hail yeah. Creek is, Hail Creek's been, uh, the easy way has been, has been a lot harder already, but it's just going to get worse. And yeah, I don't know <laughs> if soft-roading is, is the way, because just going down a highway <laughs> You need to uh, you need to have a pretty deep fording depth nowadays. I I think Highway One's just completely closed off. Yeah, I saw a video. Well, people are still doing it in their speedboats. Oh yes, I did see that video. <laughs> and hovercrafts, and and I saw a guy with a lifted ram driving through the water. Uh, you know, it's well, there's a lot going on, but yeah, hopefully we can still get to take the car out this season but it's not looking good to be yeah. honest so uh yeah we'll see how the roads go but a lot of them are flooded it's just we don't have boats <laughs> we should have got yet yet that's that's so, the next project <laughs> the kicking paddles kicking. The project <laughs> kicking stay tuned for uh updates there but i don't think we'll have much to update as far as adventures that will take this RAV4 on because uh, it's just, it's just not possible. <laughs> it's not yeah. feasible anymore. I looked because I, I may need to head north end of this month and I like I can't even right now because 99 is closed past Pemberton and uh, you can't go east either so we'll yeah. see. Well, sounds like fun times. But I think that's really it for this week. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll catch you next week. Take care, everyone. Bye now.